Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today, and then the recording is posted on our website for you to watch at your convenience, and I will show you at the end of today's show um, where you can access all of our archives. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. Um, so please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, uh, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on Encompass Live. Uh, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries. Um, this would be similar to your libraries. You know, whatever state library. Um, so we provide services and training and resources to all types of libraries in the state. So you will find um, topics on our show for all types of libraries, um, public, K-12, academics, um, corrections, museums, archives, anything and everything. Um, really the only criteria for our show is, is that it's something that libraries are doing. Uh, or something, so we bring on people from libraries or um, resources and services we think may be of use to libraries. Uh, we do book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products. Um, it just runs the gamut. Uh, we sometimes have Nebraska Library Commission staff that come on and do presentations for us on services and things that we're offering here through the commission. But we um, also have, I'm just moving my screen around here, <laughs> have um, guest speakers that we have come in and we have that today um, uh, with us. We have on the screen here you can see is Dr. Jody Green. Good morning, Jody. She's from our uh, Nebraska Extension offices here in the state of Nebraska and also on with us um, we're having webcam difficulties, but we're having screen and audio is fine, so that's all right. Um, from our Lincoln City Libraries, right here in Lincoln, Nebraska, um, is uh, Leanne Sargent and Jen Jackson. Good morning, Leanne and Jen. Good morning. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, their interface thinks it's doing the webcam, but we're not seeing it. That's okay, we've got their slides. So, and today we are going to talk about <gasps> bed bugs in the library. Good really. time. Yes. But it's not your fault. It's okay. We'll tell you all about it, how it all happened, what it's all about, and what you can do to deal with that. So I'll hand over, I think, to you, uh, Lynn and, and um, Jen. You guys are starting. All righty. Um, thank you for having us. Sorry about the webcam, which is still thinking, apparently. Um, just to kind of go over what we're going to talk about today. Um, yes, we are talking about bed bugs. It's fantastic pests that um, are always a potential issue. Um, so to start with, we'll have Jody talk about the biology of the bed bugs, um, and then we'll talk about the challenges libraries have to think of um, when it comes to bed bugs, uh, policies and procedures that we've come up with here, uh, staff training, and then we do have some pictures for those that are faint at heart, beware. Um, yes, there are there are pictures of like uh, evidence of bed bugs and stuff for uh, to show what people show people what to look for. Um, so we're going to actually hand it over to Jody to uh, let her tell us everything about the bed bug itself. Uh, okay, Jody. Okay, so Jody, you need to get your screen up then. With your yeah. Slide. All right, hold on a sec. There you go. Thanks. You should see the pop-up now for you. Yep. Are you seeing it? Yep. 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 Bed bug biology. Okay. And I'll also let everyone know before we jump into this. So um, we will have these presentations available for everybody afterwards with the recording of the show as well. And I even have an email here from Liam this morning. Um, templates for their letters and things. And so other documentation they're going to be talking about, we'll have access for all to um, for all of that um, afterwards with the recording. So go ahead, Jody, take it away. Okay, well, good morning, everyone, to those of you who are joining us today. So I am an urban entomologist, and I am located in Douglas and Sarpy County, and I'm just doing the portion on the bed bug biology, but bed bugs are something I talk about every day, probably. Um, so it's not uncommon, and 
Um, I, I love the library and I love all of the training that gets done because everyone knows what they're doing. So I think people should continue to go to the library. But um, so about bed bugs, let's see if I can. Um, bed bugs are insects and they are, uh, we call them true bugs because everyone calls the creepy crawlies bugs, but not all insects are actually in the order that are bugs. So the order is called Hemiptera and they are all separated from other bugs or insects because they have a piercing and sucking mouth part. So these may look familiar, some of them, some of them are really pretty, we may not see them like this, but these are all types of bugs related to bed bugs. And so that thing in common is that piercing, sucking mouth part that a lot of them will hold under their bodies. And so you don't see it, um, but it's like a beak, entomologists call it a rostrum, and what it's used is for sucking on liquids. And so for most of these, it's going to be plants, so they're sucking plant sap, but for bed bugs, unfortunately, their liquid of choice is going to be human blood. So bed bugs, this is what they look like. It's a, it's a, it's a close-up of what an adult bed bug looks like. So they're a reddish brown, oval-shaped, at the first, they're about a quarter of an inch long, so these are adults. They are flattened, so from the top down, so kind of flat like a pancake, we say. They do not have wings, which is a very important um, identifying character. So if anything is flying, not a bed bug. Um, and again, they have that piercing, sucking mouth part. So if you can see this one here, that rostrum or beak is held under, um, on the underside of its body. So it's important to identify the bug because there are other insects that resemble bed bugs. And the closest relative that we know is the Eastern bat bug. And if you're in places like Lincoln or Omaha, we have a lot of uh, bat population. And they also live in urban areas in our homes and our churches, um, attics type things like that. And so uh, the bat bug here um, on the right, you can see has longer hairs. And it's not just the hairs everywhere, but it's the hairs on this is the part we call the pronotum. So this is the bed bug, it's a human bed bug. Um, they have shorter hairs in relation to the eye, and you can see this bat bug has very long hairs. And so if people bring me a bug, as long as it's got a head and at least one hair, I can identify it. But it's very important because when it comes to um, treating for a bed bug or bat bug, it's very different. Um, they behave different. They, the treatment's gonna be different. And most people are thanking me when it's identified as a bat bug. So we always want to make sure. So identification is the key. So it's very difficult though, because bed bugs will look different based on their feeding status. As you can see here, a hungry bed bug versus a full bed bug, the sizes, their shapes, and their age. So you so can like see here- see Almost when they're um, hungry. Yeah, so they're yeah. pretty transparent. You can see their gut or mm -hmm. that digested blood in there. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty, I don't know, some all my things make people itch and crawl so, <laughs> and crawl, so uh, I'm used to that but um, you can see how flat they are and that's why they can hide so easily you know cracks and crevices and they go unnoticed mm -hmm. but yeah they're very they're transparent but even younger they're even uh, lighter um, but when they're fed and that's how we can tell they've been fully fed at any age they become engorged they become elongated um, and this deep dark red, but you can see this is these are each adult bed bugs, but one is uh, hungry and one is fed, so they can look very different. And then add in the different life cycles or the life stages, you can see that they appear a little bit different. So it's no wonder that people can get confused, but they are all um, you can see them with the naked eye. So that's important to know. Sometimes people are thinking they're invisible, um, but they're not. Um, you just have to know what to look for. So bed bugs develop through incomplete metamorphosis. So they go from one life stage to the next, but they don't go through a dormant or pupil stage like butterflies or moths or beetles. It's, it's going to be um, these younger ones are nymphs and they resemble the adult, but they're not able to lay eggs or mate. So the danger with that is that each one of these life stages can feed on blood and they all are going to be more or less in the same habitat, even all together in a harborage area. So this is their life cycle. They go through five developmental stages before they get to adults. So we call those as entomologists instars. So they go through five instars before becoming an adult. Each instar requires a blood meal, um, usually from a human, to get to that 
to be able to molt and shed their exoskeletons. So minimally, they'll need you know five blood meals to get to adults. So, um, and you can see the differences between what they look like. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about mating because if you know anything about bed bugs and the, the drama with them, they mate through traumatic insemination. And the reason why it's called that is because this male, his um, intromittent organ is this dangerous looking creepy thing, but he stabs her directly in the body cavity and um, ejaculates the sperm in there and she's able to store that to lay eggs. And she's actually evolved this ectospermalage in her body to be able to withstand that and the bacteria that may be introduced there. Um, so we can tell the difference um, between the sexes of the bed bugs based on the shape of the end of their abdomen. The reason why this is important is because if you find one bed bug and it's an adult male, you know, that's pretty good. If you have found an adult female, that's maybe not so good. So it's, it's one of those things that may put people a little bit more at ease. And also like if you're finding a female bed bug that's likely mated, you're gonna be looking for eggs, you're gonna be looking for nymphs. So it kind of can help with clues and to see why they are so successful in the fact um, that they can continue on um, without us knowing that they're there. So females require um, blood males to be able to lay eggs but after they do that initial mating, they can lay eggs for up to 50 days after mating. So um, that's how that works. But, um, but they do require that blood meal. So if you kept a bed bug in a container, um, it can lay eggs for 10 days, um, and, but it does need that blood meal. So this is, this is what they look like. They're very small. People seldom find eggs. Um, and this one I actually lost in a container and it was stuck to the penny because I always use a, a penny for a scale. But they're gonna be found um, laid and stuck to surfaces, furniture, upholstery. This is just a little seam or fold in a recliner. Mm -hmm. After each blood meal, they need to molt. Um, insects have exoskeletons in order to grow. And so these are just like empty shells. Sometimes they resemble, um, you know, like a popcorn kernel or something like that. But it's important to know because if you find these in the book, or in your home or anywhere that this means that there was likely that there was a bed bug there that had fed and um, molted to the next stage this illustration or this image here shows the two former exoskeletons of this nymph and then these are exoskeletons found in a harborage of you know bed bugs of uh, similar ages they feed on blood of humans and so they excrete digested blood so the fecal stains that stains you know fabric, books, um, any type of material are gonna look like dark ink stains. So depending on the surface, it will look different, but this is what it looks like when it's wet. This is what it looks like absorbed into like a paper. Um, it's kind of got a shiny raised surface. Um, if you look at it, this is a bed bug that's on uh, filter paper and you can see there's dark spots, there's a little lighter spots, but it's a, this one's a, a full bed bug and you can see that um, it's going to excrete that. So you see these signs, that is one of those um, signs that you may have uh, bed bugs that have been there or still there. Um, the rate and growth of development really depends on the environmental conditions. So um, that uh, it's not too hot, not too cold, and that there's a steady food source. And this is why infestations normally do not occur in places where people don't sleep regularly. It's gonna be those you know, hotel rooms, college dorm rooms, cabins, where people are gonna be. They feed on people. So in optimal conditions, which unfortunately is optimal conditions for our living too, you know, 70 to 90 degrees, they can complete their life cycle from egg to adult in as little as five to six weeks. Their typical lifespan is six months to a year and, you know, so three to four generations per year. But even if there's this, that one female, she can, you know, end up laying eggs that those eggs can develop and she can mate with those male offspring. So that's how infestations can occur. Um, so bed bugs locate their host by sensing the carbon dioxide that we breathe out. And then when they get closer, they can locate us through um, our body heat. Um, feeding, so they don't live on the body, they live off the body. But when they feed, it's about five to 15 minutes that it can take for them to get a blood meal. And in that time, as you can see in this video of my arm, um, they can become engorged and be, you know, three times their body weight in blood. Um, this little nymph here uh, didn't even get step off the filter paper. He just stuck his mouth part over top and started feeding. And you can see that, I mean, I think this was maybe eight minutes. It was pretty quick. So you can't feel that. I honestly could not 
feel that happening. So this is why when this occurs, we do not even know what we've been bitten by. We may wake up, you know, uh, with with symptoms, may not. This is the bed bug before it fed, and this is that same bed bug after it fed. The things entomologists do for for images for presentations, right? Yeah. Wow. Thank yeah. you, brave. Yeah. <laughs> I only did that that one time. This was, this was this bed bug was actually called the chosen one. So. <laughs> <laughs> adult bed bugs, uh, they don't have to feed every day. So that same bed bug only needs to feed every three to five days in order to get the, the meal that it needs and um, to molt or to lay eggs if it's a female, um, a female adult. Um, what they do is they inject these compounds to aid in blood feeding so that we can't feel them and so that we don't clot. And so um, some people are allergic to that. And you'll see that I am and some people aren't. And this is the danger of of not being allergic and then not having any symptoms and then having, you know, when people say, how did you not know you had bed bugs? If you have no reaction and they're such good hiders, it is very difficult to locate that you may have a problem. Uh, for me, I'm like a sentinel. I swell up, I'm allergic. You can see that um, I've, and this is being in, uh, staying in hotel rooms, but 30% of the population is thought to have no reaction to bed bugs. So it's only some people are reactive. Um, is it are, if you're allergic to other types of things like other types of biting things is it would that be related to being more um, some people are yeah they have sensitive skin and they ha they are allergic to the compounds of like mosquito saliva so i'm very allergic to those things um and mm -hmm. you can see this is this is what happens um this is when i fed that bed bug so i swell up immediately some people have a delayed reaction so it could be up to a week later um, and other people have no reactions at all. I get couples in here that have, like my wife has bed bugs. And I'm like, well, do you sleep in the same bed? Yes, well, you have bed bugs too. You're just not allergic. <laughs> so yeah. that happens. So I just wanna point that out because it's important to know to do those inspections and identify you're not always gonna feel it and you're not always gonna see um, you know, symptoms. But after a bed bug feeds, it returns to its harborage or where it's hiding. And this is gonna be normally close to the host. They are going to rest and they're going to digest. So that's why when you've been bitten or you think you've been bitten and you go to look for a bed bug, they're not going to be wandering around. They're going to be hiding somewhere. So close to the bed, they're called bed bugs, but they're not necessarily found on the bed. Um, you know, mattress, seams, uh, like this is like the tag, any kind of like fold or, you know, hidden places. This is a corner guard. This is a dust cover. All of those places can provide a harborage for a small little insect. Um, and then, you know, the bed frame, anything that's covered. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of places they can't hide because they are so small. Um, but I do want to talk about the difference between an introduction and an infestation. So an introduction is when a bed bug um, is dropped from a person that may spend time somewhere that has an infestation or lives in a, you know, an apartment, a home that's infested. So they've dropped a bed bug. And so you may just find one that's just um, there. And this was, uh, I think, a food pantry. I a bed bug. So, so that would have been an introduction. It's not worth, you know, like using pesticide or doing something crazy in that specific environment. It's take that bed bug out, do an inspection, let's vacuum the room, um, as opposed to an infestation where it's where people are going to sleep nearly every single night regularly, or at least every three to five days, like in a hotel. That's where there's going to be eggs, there's going to be exoskeleton, and there's going to be bed bugs of all life stages. And that's going to be where that infestation is. So if you can tell the difference between that. Um, and unfortunately, this is actually a backpack. So this could be a walking infestation. But this person put their backpack right beside their bed every night. And that's where they sleep. So they had that blood meal to, to continue its life cycle and generations. So bed bugs get around to places, you know, since they don't fly or jump. They get around because we carry them around. We basically let them hitchhike on our things. And this includes luggage, it includes used furniture. Sometimes we pick things up. Um, I mean, I know in college, I picked up all my stuff used, um, you know, and, and these things are things we need to think about. Um, and then the reason the library comes in is because um, if you're like me, sometimes we have books by our bedside table for quite a while. That becomes part of our host sleeping area. And if there's you know, a bed bug infestation, bed bugs will likely, um, they can get into the books and then they become a library issue when people drop them off. So that's my segment. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Sure, 
Thanks, Jody. Um, yeah, anybody have any questions uh, you want to ask about any of the life cycle of a bed bug? Uh, go ahead and type into the questions section of the GoToWebinar interface. I can grab them from there and we can. Um... Nobody asked anything while you were talking, so that's good. Give a couple of seconds here. No, no, oh, just very interesting. That's a, yeah, lots of good information there on you know i think it's good to see what it looks like in real life because i'm sure a lot of people don't know they they hear the <clears throat> bed bug and they get the fear they hear the word bud bug and they get the fear but they don't know well what am i looking for and having those pictures definitely is going to help people figure this out all right so we're going to switch back to you now leanne awesome all right did you i'm going to make you present your again so you should be able to slide, do your slides <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Jody, for joining us and uh, helping us to understand the cycles of bed bugs and making us itch. Yeah. Um, yes, I am itching. It's probably good the camera's not on because I <laughs> am just like itching like crazy now. Um, when it comes to the bed bugs in the library, um, we noticed an increase in uh, infestations. Uh, about a decade ago, um, we took the first book that we um, found any evidence on to the extension office uh, for the bed bug identification. Um, the extension office has been very helpful all along, um, willing to look at items that we aren't sure about, um, et cetera, et cetera, um, helping us to figure out our policies and whatnot as well. Um, but because there is more evidence of bed bug, um, bed bugs potentially in the library, we decided that we needed a bed bug committee. Um, so that was formed here at Bennett Martin Public Library. Some things that uh, the committee had to consider, um, things like policy considerations, um, how to train and determine best practices for staff, um, how to go about treating materials, because there's a variety of ways to do that, as we'll show in a bit. Um, determining the procedures that we use for uh, workflows when items do come in with evidence and uh, notifying customers. Um, and then providing information to the public um, so that it doesn't become a scary thing to them. Um, we do recommend, like I said, turning to the professionals at the extension office for help when needed. Um, but the bottom line is the excuse me, the preventative maintenance and early detection helped to prevent infestations. Mm -hmm. Okay, policy considerations that we have dealt with here um, when it comes to dealing with customers and bed bug damage items. Uh, questions you'll probably have to ask are, uh, do we discard or treat the materials? Um, when we first process the materials, um, if we found any evidence of bed bugs, we would pull it plus anything around it in the proximity that could be infested. Um, then we review them. If they do have uh, obvious bed bug uh, signs, then we likely will discard the item. It's something we aren't going to add back to the collection. Um, we do have a freezer. Um, that works really well, like a big uh, chest chest freezer. Is that what they're called? I think they're called two body freezers. Two body. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the big big. Very descriptive there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the true crime lover in me. Um, um, yeah. Basically, have a big freezer, um, and the freezer works really well. You just have to make sure it freezes to zero degrees. Um, and when it comes to freezing items, you do have to leave them in the freezer a minimum of four days. Um, we also do have a what we call a bakery, um, essentially a heater that we can turn on and put things in and that we leave those in there for approximately eight hours. So we'll plug it in in the morning when we have items that need to be treated and then we'll unplug at the end of the day. Um, things also to consider with that would be uh, books can be used in the heat in the uh, bakery, but uh, you wouldn't want to put like DVDs, cases, stuff like that that could potentially melt. Um, 
when it comes to contacting a customer, we send a letter to the customer, excuse me, based on which occurrence it is. Um, here at Lincoln City Libraries, we have a first, second, and third occurrence letters. Um, the first one basically just says there's been evidence, and so we need you to, if you have other items, we ask that they return them in Ziploc bags and bring them to the desk instead of putting them in book drop. Um, the second uh, basically tells them that, you know, you can't check out anymore, you need to get it dealt with. The third is an actually a certified letter that'll be de uh, delivered that the director of the library signs. Um, these have all been approved by the director in the legal department. Um, it is, like I said, important to tell the customer how to return the materials, because um, if they do have bed bugs, it's you know, entirely possible that they'll be in more than one piece of library property if they have it. Um, so you do want them to seal it and bring it to the desk instead of putting it in the bin where it could potentially infest other items. Um, when it comes to dealing with repeat customers, some things to think about. Um, do we, you know, would you want to ban the person from the library, uh, their personal belongings, such as backpacks, book bags? Um, here we require, if somebody has made it to the uh, third, ban, third letter, which means they've been banned, um, we do require proof of treatment for them to be able to return to the library and to check out any more items. Um, so far, when we assess the damage of an item, we will put the item charge on the customer's account. Generally, that has been enough to uh, initially at least prevent people from checking out more items because they can't check out with the fine on the card. But if it's a repeat issue, then we do, we have turned to banning in um, a few instances. Uh, mostly it ends up getting taken care of prior to that. Mm -hmm. I do have a question about policy um, uh -huh. that uh, just <laughs> came up. Um, and I think it's a very good question. Uh, you, you guys, you know, you had started seeing instances of this happening. But the question is, how do you get your board to admit that you have to make a policy on bed books? I suppose the situation being it hasn't come up yet, but we should be prepared. How do you convince them that? I was going to say, I think just having a, like evidence. Um, so if you do start finding items that have evidence, I mean, you can take those straight to the board. Treat um, them first. But yeah, treat them first <laughs> after they've been treated, because the evidence isn't going to disappear after the treatment. Um, that it just won't spread. Uh, and then data, like uh, like what Jody has given us today, um, I think all of that helps. Um, especially knowing that the library isn't necessarily the starting place of the potential infestations. Um, but it, I mean, really, bed bugs can be anywhere. Um, but because of the nature of libraries, um, it could potentially become a place where it spreads if something's brought in and not seen. Like the the bed bug evidence isn't seen, and then it goes to check out again. Is I mean, this we're just potentially spreading that there. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think the biggest thing would be evidence and, mm -hmm. and data. And in, in general, with with policies, library policies, it's it's better if you can't. I mean, that's definitely true. Hey, look, it's happened. We need to have a response now that this has become an issue. But also, you need to be prepared before it happens as well. And that's just something to talk to your board about in general. That we're going to have policies for lots of things we haven't encountered yet, but we need them first. We have to right. realize that this is something that happens in other libraries and other communities. It could happen here and we should be prepared right off the bat so that if it comes up here, we already have a process in place of how we deal with it. Yeah, um, you don't wait until after something's happened and then scramble around to figure out, uh oh, now what do we do? I mean, you've got policies for other things in the library, um, other library activities that maybe you have not actually had happen yet, but you know you want to be prepared beforehand just in case. You utilize the experiences of others. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, right here, Lincoln City Libraries. Yes, we know they're a bigger city than us. However, right. um, it can be anywhere. Um, right. Um, and then we have a question too. 
which maybe would be for Jody, but you guys might know as well. Um, does the diatomaceous earth help prevent spread? I suppose that's something that people have heard that it can. So diatomaceous earth is something that the bed bug has to come in contact with. Mm -hmm. And often when I see that applied, it's not applied appropriately. Like it's just yeah. a white powder dusted everywhere. And so that's, it's, it's not usually affected, effective the way that it's used. Because they get in those little crevices and if that doesn't get in those little crevices and hiding places, it's... Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there are more effective dusts, um, but they need to be applied directly to those cracks and crevices um, mm -hmm. so that they, they are going to be likely to come in contact with it and less uh, danger to humans. True, that too, yep. Um, and another good question that popped up because we're still talking about policies. <laughs> yep. Do your policies also, um, for you, uh, Leanne and, and Jen, do your policies include fleas and lice as well, or do you have whole separate policies for those? <laughs> um, we don't have separate policies. We have a sort of generic policy. Um, I'm going to read the wording that's straight out of our like library rules and behavior policy. Um, so a repeated return of borrowed materials infested with insects, including but not limited to bed bugs or cockroaches, or live insects observed on body or belongings. So it's that would cover, yeah. Ends up being a little more encompassing. Um, but yeah, we have to see evidence of it mm -hmm. in either case. So it would include those because it's broad enough to, yeah. Right. Right. Would, yeah. Please, that would that, that wording would include fleas and lice. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Go ahead. All right. Well, I am going to talk about the staff training. That's where I come in, um, being the direct supervisor of the majority of our frontline and backroom staff here at uh, Bennett Martin. Um, it's my job to make sure everybody is trained on identification of bed bugs and and damage because you may not actually see a bug or a carcass, but you know you may see those blood spots and, and, and um, other evidence. Uh, we also need all our staff members to, if they don't know every step of the workflow procedures, once they have found evidence, um, they know at least the first couple, which is to not panic and to bag the item and leave it where they're at and come and find a supervisor. Um, but then we do have written procedures that we pull out every time and follow to the letter, um, which is really helpful because in those moments when you have confirmed that, yes, indeed, you're dealing with a bed bug, maybe it's live, maybe it's not, um, things, <laughs> things tend to get heightened a little bit and we do all start itching and, and kind of, we have to remind ourselves to stay down on earth here. Um, we also talk a lot about what to say to the public. Um, this is a really sensitive thing. You know, people automatically assume if you even insinuate that there has potentially been evidence of bed bugs in materials that they've returned, that somehow you're saying that they have a dirty house or that they're filthy or that they're, you know, which is absolutely not the case. Um, this can happen to anybody. It's a community wide um issue blame. yeah and they also want to blame someone they want to blame the library they want to blame someone else um so we kind of talk about keep, you know keeping it very discreet and, and and private and being very sensitive to their feelings about it um yeah. you don't want to jump in and just be like you have bed bugs no <laughs> it, it's definitely a Raises sensitive a sensitive thing mm -hmm. to um, encounter, especially if someone is trying to um, check out materials after um, having returned something that has been infested and a note pops up on their account and then that person on the front line has to, you know, let them know mm -hmm. potentially before they've gotten their letter notifying them. Um, we've had that happen before, and, and our staff were prepared, and they handled it beautifully. So, um, you know, preparation is the key, I guess. Um, we also let them know um, how, to, how to protect themselves. I mean, 
usually what we're finding is evidence. Um, we have had situations where we've had live bed bugs in the library, things like that. But we always just advise people, you know, go home if you can, you know, <laughs> take your clothes off in the garage, throw them in the, the dryer for, you know, a while, um, you know, be careful with your belongings and things like that. Um, I think, thank Sorry. you. <laughs> All right, um, workflow considerations. We, ex we inspect all materials that come in that are being checked in. Uh, we've trained our staff on how to do that, how to check uh, the spines, the corners, the creases, all those places that those little um, hitchhikers like to uh, hide. And um, part of me wants to say, unfortunately, but it's also a good thing. Our staff is, is very, very good. They're very meticulous um, and uh, detailed about looking at, at items and, and um, checking for stains and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, if they do find something that's questionable, we have to determine if it's obvious bed bug damage or if it's suspected. Um, one of the workflow procedures that we absolutely maintain, I'm, a, I'm pretty strict about this, is when our staff is checking items in on a cart, those items don't go anywhere. They do not get sorted in any way away from that cart until the entire cart has been checked in and every item has been examined. Uh, we've had too many situations where, um, you know, you get three quarters of a way through checking in a cart and somebody finds, you know, a, a perfectly squished bed bug in an item. And then we have to go back and find all of those items. There's potential cross contamination for our whole, you know, collection. So we're very, I guess, siloed in that way keeping everything, you know, contained. Um, you just but, make it a habit of everybody that, I think for other types of damage you're checking for too, just, you know. Exactly, exactly, or liquid cases, damage. Get a dog like pee that. on it, whatever. Right, <laughs> yeah. right, exactly. I mean, I, you know, personally, I'd much rather have to check in, or, you know, examine a book that a dog peed on than <laughs> find bed bugs, but, you know, such is life. Um, we also, because, well, how should I say this? If we do find materials on a specific cart, what we do then is treat everything. Um, we do have in our workflows a little bit different procedure for things that are just suspected, um, that may have been near or come into contact, but may not be the, the infected material. Um, part of that is, you know, charging the customer where we're finding the evidence, placing holds on any of their outstanding items so that when those items come back in, no matter where they return them, that pops up and we know to bag it right away and um, get it in a freezer or a bakery for treatment. Um, and then as Leanne was talking about, we do contact the customer. Uh, we prepare a letter based on the um, first, second, or third occurrence, and we reach out to them and just let them know, give them the information they need um, to return items safely. Um, and then after items have been treated, whether it's four days in the freezer or a day in the bakery, um, we have a team who, a team, a team of two. <laughs> we have a couple of staff members who are kind of specially trained in, you know, re-evaluating all of those items because we know that not everything is, you know, is an issue because of bed bugs, um, but the possibility is there. So they've been trained to re-examine them and determine whether or not we're discarding them or returning them to the collection. Someone had, someone had a question related to that, because yeah. um, concerned about, you know, if the the bed bug spotting that you know from the the blood is on the item the treatment of it's not going to remove that 
correct? Right. Correct. Right. So would that potentially keep popping up as a new discovery of potential bed bugs? How do you tell? What, <laughs> what we do whenever we find damage of any kind, whether it's um, you know, pen marks or something in an item, if it's something that we feel is appropriate to still keep on our shelf to, to remain in the collection, um, we make a note on the back, on the back inside cover on our um, on our labels, so that it doesn't just keep coming back through the cycle and you know charging, trying to charge someone else or trying you know having to bag a whole cart full of things because we mm -hmm. see spots of blood or something. We we try to make note of that so that we're not repeating that, no matter what kind of damage we're looking at. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, I mean, you could note that somewhere, note it in the, even in the record in your catalog. Yeah. This was actually treated on so-and-so date, so, mm -hmm. yeah. If it's really bad enough, we're just not even gonna keep that yeah. item, we'll, we'll reorder it, you know, so, sure. um, if necessary, but. Yeah, but, um, we do have some other yeah. questions about the, um, checking the, um, checking the uh, items when they come back in. Um, <clears throat> how much time does this add to the check-in process? Um, or do you even know that because it's just become part of the process? I guess that's a question. For us, it's really become part of the process. I would not say that it adds a lot when you've got um, well-trained people. Now, mm -hmm. you know, you're teaching them certain places to look and, and what to look for, but once they start, you know, once they start knowing what they're looking for, it, it does, it becomes uh, second nature to be checking all the different places on an item, making sure things look the way, you know, it's coming back in the, in the condition we need it to come back in. Right. Um, I think that probably is, you know, a concern. People think, oh, now we're gonna have to, but it's- Initially it does add some time because you're learning. Right, you're learning. Where but, to look and what to look for and whatnot. But I will say, well worth the time spent because mm -hmm. the alternative is you miss something and then you're you know you've got shelves and shelves uh, of books or even furniture in the library that is now infested with bed, bed mm -hmm. bugs or cockroaches or you know who knows what or right. mold you know or, or you're um um confronting the wrong patron about mm -hmm. exactly. damage whether exactly. it's bed bugs or other damage as well, you want to make sure. I think that just is to be part of your process of checking in items is making sure it's still in yep. good condition. And do you, in case you do need to contact that person about, you know, insect infestation or other damage, you, you yeah, absolutely make that exactly. a thing. You know? Yeah. All um, right. So, any other questions on that, or should we move on to treating? Um. We've got questions about treatment, so I'll let you talk first. Okay. And then okay, we'll see fantastic. Into them. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we have um, one of the first things that our committee had to do was obviously determine how are we going to treat items that we get in the moment. Um, and so what we did, the libraries invested in uh, the freezers. Just it's small freezers. You know, I'm, you know, the not a great big huge long thing. They fit in our back room. Um, we had to make room for those. We also, I don't believe we bought the, what we call the bakery. I don't think, I think we just have one or maybe two in our system. Um, but it is super lightweight, super easy to move around. Um, and it comes in very, very handy if you end up with a large amount um, of items that you end up having to treat which we have had happen. Um, unfortunately, you know, if there's one book on one cart, but it's completely full, and then you find one or two books on another cart, they tend to come in uh, spurts, and it'll be, you know, one every day. Well, if something has to be frozen for four days, sometimes it can get backed up, but that bakery comes in really handy to do uh, some of those paper print, you know, items, and it holds a lot. So you can get a lot done and treated and out of the way um, by having that as well as a um, supplemental. 
Um, I will say that uh, we tried to get freezers at every branch. I think there's a couple smaller branches that didn't have room for them, but most locations do. Um, this also prevents uh, having to transfer potentially infested items between branches to get the treatment. Sure. In the delivery, yes, that was a big problem for us. People were not processing things properly and they would send them down here to our central library and then we ended up with bigger infestations and having to deal with, you know, messes that <laughs> was kind of a nightmare. Um, we also, you know, lots of Ziploc bags. We just get the big gallon um, Ziploc bags. Uh, and for obvious evidence, items that we know have infestation, we double bag all of that. Um, if it's a whole cart that I have to have a staff member bag up, I, I might have them just do um, single bags. Uh, and we try to get several items in each bag. Sometimes if you're dealing with small paperbacks and everything, you can get a bunch in there. So it might seem like a big waste. But the other thing is as well, if, it's, if there are bags that are just on the suspected items, we reuse those once they're done because they've been, you know, treated in a freezer or cooked or whatever. Um, we we recycle those since they haven't come in contact with any actual, you know, real damage. Um, latex gloves. I'm sure that most of us probably have a store of those left over from this last year. So, um, some of my my uh, backline staff still feel most comfortable handling our materials, wearing like latex yes. gloves now anyway. Um, the one thing that I would recommend, <laughs> I use them a lot. Uh, we did not have them until I started in this position and it, it made me really nervous if someone, you know, came to me and said, I don't know if this, you know, these spots, I don't know if that's actually evidence or what that is. I can't tell. And it's a little ambiguous to the naked eye. So, you know, I wanted to be sure, uh, partly for my own you know, peace of mind, but also because we were having instances where the line to treat things in our freezer was getting backed up because it was just kind of boom, 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 and we were running out of space. So I wanted to be absolutely sure. Now I brought them today, but since our webcam is not uh, working, you won't get to see me put on my really, really super attractive jeweler's glasses. Uh, my staff usually laughs at me, but I'm like, no, I'm putting these things on. I want to be sure. They have really little headlights sure. on. Yeah, them. yeah. You can, you can change sure. out the little power of the lens. And I do, I mean, I just, some of my staff, I think they think I'm crazy, but you know, you get right down there on the, on the page. I'm not touching it. You know, <laughs> nothing's going to jump on me or anything, but I, I would say I am about 99% sure every time I look at something and I know I can look at it and say, um, no, that's, that's ash from somebody sitting out by their fire pit or, you know, that's a, a piece of food or something rather than, you know, a, a an egg, a bed bug egg or something like that. Mm -hmm. I can be sure. And, um, it just, it say it can save a lot of work because that is the thing. I would say checking every material for evidence of this sort, evidence of any kind of damage may seem like it adds a lot of time, but if you find the damage, having to go through this process can be hugely time consuming and it's a lot of work. I would rather be 100% sure if we're gonna have to spend time doing that. So sure. Sure. Um, these are super inexpensive on Amazon. Uh, we got them for every location in our, in our system so that everybody can be sure. And like I said, they come in totally handy, um, very, very handy. Uh, it's kind of rare for us to get something where you're seeing an intact carcass where you can say, yep, that's a flattened bed bug. I mean, it does happen, but sometimes it's more just the evidence of the blood stop spotting and things like that. So. Mm -hmm. The other thing um, we invested in is, it's called Bed Bug Killer. It's Eco Raider. I don't, I think. I also have here to show you, but can't. <laughs> I think that, um, I'm not sure. I think that our previous uh, branch manager worked with Jody on this. Maybe not. I might be wrong. Jody, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a spray. It's, it's plant extract based. And 
really we just use this if we've had a situation where um oh no i picked up that book and i think it was a bug and it, it fell out and i don't know where it was not you know not a live bug but you know we might spray the carpet around an area or spray down countertops we've had people come in and dump a bag of books on our counter in front of us and then a you know a live bug skitters out or something um so this is it's kind of safe to use in public areas and things like that um and is it specific to bed bugs or other it, things? it's called bed bug killer oh yeah it, um, it uh, says it's natural specific. insecticidal act actives fast kill with 100 percent efficacy kills adults nymphs and eggs um child pet bird and fish friendly low odor and non-staining <laughs> i wouldn't i don't know if this is something that i would necessarily like treat my house with maybe that's what people do i would personally get professionals but mm -hmm. um we have used it here like we did have one instance where we saw a, a patron had visible bed bugs on them um so we kind of followed the area that that person had traveled in the library um, and sprayed to try to ensure that there Nothing weren't any here. Fell off and, yeah. mm -hmm. decided to. and this is, I mean, I'm sure you can get it elsewhere, but I just double checked and it is available just on like Amazon. So it's not specialty mm -hmm. in the sense that you have to go through some um, out of the ordinary uh, location to get it. Right. Jody, you wanted to say something about the sprayer? Oh, or? Yeah. So e Ecorator, there. I mean, it is a botanical based insecticide for uh, for bed bugs. However, it's a contact. So you have to spray it on it. So it's not like you would want to spray your whole house or the whole library and anything walking over it would contact it. Right. So in what you were doing, I think that's perfectly fine because, you know, you're seeing you're seeing it and you're treating it for most people who have um, suspicions in their own home. We really don't recommend anyone treating anything unless they really do have evidence that there's a bed bug so i mean for your cases yeah if you see it fall down and you want to kill it um yeah. you know that that would work they do sell them in like little uh versions too so you can travel with them so you know it's in the case if you wanted to spray the zipper of your luggage or something like that but it's not something you would want to spray your home with um but yeah no i'm glad that you guys have something to use <laughs> i think it also uh works as peace of mind for our staff because that's yeah. the first thing they want to do is you know wipe down all areas wipe down anything they touch use hand sanitizer mm -hmm. so um but yeah as i said i would definitely be contacting the professionals <laughs> um in which case that's kind of a perfect time for me to turn it back over to leanne i knew that she would absolutely mm -hmm. insist we on do have a couple it. of questions oh, okay, um, so that's the about the treatment too you know um so how so for you've got heat treatment and freeze treatment how do you okay. determine which one to do or do you do both we default to the freezer always the freezer however if our freezer gets full which it can mm -hmm. you know um like i said we got kind of the smaller freezers maybe something like the size you'd have in your garage um but yeah. depending on the library maybe you get a great big huge one so that you don't have to run into this problem but because of the size of our freezers and occasionally i mean we may go weeks and weeks with never having anything in it and then we may have a couple of different days where we have um, items that we need to treat and it's full um, that's why we have the backup of that bakery and like yeah. i said we only put print materials in there so we can kind of pick and choose if we've got a ton of dvds or something well we'll put those in the freezer they can't go in the heater yeah right i mean i think that people have accidentally stuck things in the bakery and we were okay on it but when you're talking about potentially losing a bunch of you know money and materials if they get cooked and warped or something like that i wouldn't yeah. take the chance um that's but, how you which to use you don't have to do both you can pick one or the other depending on the Space yeah, and what the item is yeah. more than we need to yeah. um so like 
you know, it, like Jen had said about the cart checking in, if we find something on the cart, we'll end up treating the whole cart just to be cautious. That's a lot, yeah. Which could fill your whole yeah, freezer. Which could fill the freezer. And then if you have another cart or something that comes in even the next day, because they have to be in there for four days, if we have evidence the next day, well, we might try to put as much of that as we can in the bakery so that we can get it out of the way or we bag everything up and it kind of you know we'll take the stuff where we absolutely are sure of evidence and we'll make sure to get that treated asap but yeah. if there's suspected materials we bag everything and it it may have to sit there for a little bit but that's partly because of the size of library we are and also like leanne said we we probably over treat to be on the safe side well, better be safe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a few more questions, but um, I wanted to say first, it, um, it did just hit 11 a.m., um, but we're not going to stop um, do the show or anything. Um, we'll go as long as it takes for um, uh, Leanne and Jen to get through their slides and get all of your questions answered. Um, if you do need to leave, that's okay. If you only allotted the one hour for watching us, we're recording, and um, the whole recording will be available to you watch later so you can catch anything you missed. Um, I also know, I think, Jody, you had mentioned you might need to take off for something else right now. So if you do. Yeah, I can stay on for another like 10 minutes. Okay, sure. Yeah, you just okay. let us know, no problem. So if anybody has any specific Jody questions, make sure you get them in. Say, um, if anybody has that, let's do that now. Um, but we did have, so what was the other question? Oh, um, the latex gloves that you mentioned. So do they have to be latex or just any kind of glove? Is this, that's just they don't have to be latex for those with the, uh, latex allergies but the um just like the any kind of gloves, gloves yeah. Like that, yeah and then um one of the treatment question can you quarantine items in ziploc bags as a treatment meaning i guess just in a ziploc would that actually do anything on its own just put it in a bag spread but i don't believe it'll kill the bug. i guess jody mm -hmm. would probably be a better answer at this like eventually Without feeding, I would assume they would die, but I can't imagine. They would, would. It would probably be. Uh, I mean, it would be at least a month, three yeah, months. Say, they can live a long them. time without feeding. Mm, yeah. So that would be a month-long quarantine of the months. So I, mean, I wouldn't even feel safe if, it, unless it was probably three and a half, four months in a Ziploc bag. Yeah. yeah, that's a long time to have things set off, not used. Yeah. 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 So you're probably go with looked into freezing or heating instead. <laughs> yeah. But, and Jody, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but depending on the outside temperature, you know, like in the middle of winter, you could potentially put something out in um, an uninsulated storage unit or something um, for a few days and or during the, you know, 100 degree temperatures in the summer, um, yeah. bake them out that way as well. Uh, I would, yeah, I mean, I would have a thermal, like I would have a thermometer there. Right. Usually in Nebraska, it doesn't get cold enough. Like if you were to put your mattress outside or anything like that, I mean, it's gotta be zero degrees Fahrenheit for four to right. like for at least 96 hours, I believe. Okay. Uh, yeah. like I think Valentine's day, we hit that, but there has not been any other time since I've been with extension that people could put things outside. Um, right. And then when it comes to like a hot car or anything, if you have it maybe in a container and put it in, um, you know, that might work or a bag, but you know, if you think about like a, a car and where you put maybe like for me, my chapstick, like I always know where the cold sinks are so that I don't melt all my things. And so bedbugs mm -hmm. will find a way to escape that lethal temperature if they can. Right. Yeah. All right, go ahead. All right, one other uh, resource we use um, mm -hmm. are bed bugs sniffing dogs. Mm -hmm. um, we used to have a dog named Spots that was our primary bed bug hunter. Um, he's mostly retired now, but we do have Ruby and Charlotte. Um, they come quarterly to all of our branches, all of our locations. Um, when, uh, when an item is deemed to have um, bed bug evidence in it, the dog will bark to alert us. Um, we'll then, if it's a book, we'll take generally that shelf of books in the um, shelves just above or below um, to try to, you know, make sure we cover everything um, and treat those like we do with the workflows treatment that Jen took you through. Um, and when it comes to furniture being infested, um, we used to have to send our chairs or et cetera, like with the company to take them and treat them and they'd be gone for about a week. Um, 
they've modified things now so that they can treat on site um, and generally we can return it to the public area within 24 hours. So this is how often, because someone did actually ask, it's, in, it's cool that you moved on to this slide, um, about staff conducting inspections on furniture. So mm -hmm. this, do you guys do that or is this how the furniture is checked would be with the dogs? Um, generally it's with the dogs unless we have some uh, reason or inkling that we need to check something specific. But yeah, we usually, we bring them in quarterly so that they can uh, try to cover anything that we may miss. So a preventative type. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, and then we do, like we said, contacting the customers. We've talked about some here. Um, when we talk to customers, we want to educate customers um, as to how we're addressing the threat of bed bugs. So we will let people know our process of our preventative measures and the processes we take um, when there is suspected uh, evidence. Um, have to think of things like if there if materials are returned with the bed bug evidence what happens then um, there again we try to be discreet in our talking to the customers in the sense of we have found evidence of bed bugs rather than saying like you have, you have bed bugs. bugs yeah, yeah. Um, customers I have found get very defensive even at the thought of potentially having bed bug evidence um, lots of people are quick to say well, I got them from you, you know, it's not us and I'm clean and this and that. And there's a misconception that bed bugs are only in dirty places as well. Sure. So yeah. um, they're like legitimately anywhere. Um, and then we oftentimes will point customers um, to the FAQs that we have, but then also um, to the extension office as well for any other information that they might want on um, bed bugs and identifying information. And we do have some photos of examples here. They aren't necessarily as creepy as <laughs> the, the live bed bugs or whatever that Jody had, but um, here's some, Jen's gonna take us through some examples of bed bug evidence um, as to some things to be looking for. Specifically on library materials, you know, these are the kinds of things that I would see. You can see the dot right here and then the smudge um, a little dot up, he up here at the top. Those are the kind of things that, you know, you look at and you may go, oh yeah, that's evidence of bed bugs, but it could also be, you know, food schmucks. Mm -hmm. And that's why I love my little jeweler's glasses. <laughs> if I have a staff member come to me unsure. Um, this, however, is much more obvious and, mm -hmm. and a greater indicator of what you would see. Um, one of the first things that I tell people when they're te they're learning how to check in and, and look for these types of things is to look, especially this is a hardcover item, um, you know, look at the bottoms, look at the tops, specifically right around the spine. We also, and we don't have a slide of this, but we also open the book and flop it open and let the dust jacket kind of fall away from the spine and look down that spine. Um, mm -hmm. They like to hide in those dark areas. Mm -hmm. um, here's a close up of that, you know, yeah. the, the stitching and everything. This is blood mm -hmm. spots and, and evidence here. Um, that's a pretty good indicator. That's, you know, yeah. that's a no brainer. We bag it and we're treating that one. And um, But we also, you know, flip through the pages. We generally find less in the pages, unless it is a big severe infestation where someone's reading and a bug crawls across their page and they don't notice it or don't care. Um, but these are very similar to the photos that Jody showed us where it's soaking into the paper. You can see the blood and spotty evidence, mm -hmm. um, feces. Um, I think this is an exoskeleton. I thought, I guess I thought it was a, bug that maybe hadn't fed yet, but um, you can see the little, I can't remember what Jody called it. Beak. 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 Thank you. <laughs> I was going to call it a poker. Sorry. I learned something. It's a beak. <laughs> yeah, it's a beak. <laughs> um, and, you know, you may, you may be able to see this, but you might not be sure. This is obviously a very blown up one. Um, sometimes they're easier to see than, than others, but uh, this is exactly why I purchased those jeweler's glasses so that I can be as sure as possible before um, 
that so that we can take the right steps in treating and, and following our workflows, um, making sure that we're contacting the right customer um, and handling everything properly. Okay. All right. Um, just a little bit more, I guess, about our bed bug uh, dog sniffers. Um, we go through a company called Canine Bed Bug Detection. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, Spots is mainly retired, but this now they generally bring in their two dogs, Ruby and Charlotte, and kind of, especially at Fenn and Martin, where we're on multiple levels, um, they spread out and cover ground a little faster. So um, someone did actually have a question. I'm glad you mentioned that. Wanted to know what the cost is of the dogs. Oh, good that is a good question. Um, <laughs> off the top of my head, I'm not entirely sure. I feel oh, like... But it's a specific company, Canine Bed Bug Deten Detection, that does this as a thing. Yes. yes. And they're uh -huh. fantastic. I want to say... I'm trying to think invoice wise. I think it was like 250 for a branch, maybe. That could be way wrong. Um, it may depend on the size. I think it's the size, yeah. Of the building. And as well, we also have a contract for all our locations, which is mm -hmm. eight different locations of varying, you know, various sizes. So, um, but you see a picture of James there. He's fantastic mm -hmm. to work with. We highly recommend. Um, checking them out right and they're based um, here in lincoln or yes you know. but they also they will also treat lincoln omaha bellevue fremont mm -hmm. norfolk grand island <coughs> carney york beatrice council bluffs iowa and i think probably more than that i think they're willing to go um quite a ways to help out with this um, i found their website and i'll share it i'll make sure everybody has access to that yeah and it yeah k9 is like the letter k9 k9 yeah, <laughs> yeah. detection yeah yeah and then that is all uh, we have. Here's our uh, contact information for Dr. Jody, myself, and Jen here at Lincoln City Library. Jody had to take off. She's just gone. That's good. Thank you, Jody. Yeah. <laughs> She's already gone. Yeah. But yeah, please let us know if you have any questions. You know, you think of something later or want to know specifics on, you know, how we may handle something. I mean, we kind of went through the treatment. We didn't talk a lot about how we handle it on a customer's account, but we do have very specific. Um, detailed workflows on on all of that. So please contact us if you if you need more need more guidance. We know it's it's definitely something that will freak everybody out, um, staff, patrons um, alike. That's a, somebody but, did ask, which is an interesting way of putting the question. How do you get staff comfortable doing the ex inspections? Is it just don't focus on the bed bug? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when I when I train people, I'm I, we do it, we're training them to check in. And part of that check-in process is examining mm -hmm. all our materials damage. for damage. And or therefore, whatever. you know, damage. then you're talking about, yeah. okay, so some of the damages that we're looking for, this is what you want to look for. And, you know, I, we, I mean, we have a great big poster in our back room with, you know, the different, different images of bed bugs and the, you know, all these kind of things that we've looked at today. Um, <laughs> It takes time, you know. I haven't had anybody run out the door yet on their first day when I mentioned it. Um, <laughs> but you know, that first time, I always tell them, "Look, when in doubt, if you're worried about it, if you think, bag it up, leave the item where they where it is." You know, we we um, really really emphasize no cross contamination. If you find a suspect material, don't carry it across the library to come and find me in my office. Mm -hmm. um, leave it where it's at. Bag it. And then come get me and we'll go through it together and we'll walk, you know, <laughs> you're not alone in this. <laughs> yeah. um, I have a lot of staff come to me and just say, I have a bug for you to look at, which is always great to hear. Um, <laughs> and then uh, generally, you know, there's a couple that are like, I'm pretty sure it's not a bad bug, but I just want a second opinion before I move mm -hmm. on, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. So they'll, They'll bag it as if they were bed bugs, even if they don't think it is, and we'll take a look at it. And it's say, good to play it safe just in case you'd rather yeah, yeah. Yeah, err on the side of caution. They definitely. Go on with, you know what they're doing, and if it is, then we take the uh, extra precautions with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then we all walk around itching our hair, and they don't <laughs> generally crawl into your hair, so we're, you know, it's, it's just one of those irrational reactions. Uh -huh. um, yes. Yeah. You know, um, all right, so we do have someone else who did say, let's see, um, 
we've as here i'm in my head yeah uh we've had oh the dogs someone else said they've had that done at their location um and it was 200 dollars per location so um that might but be I mean, that right. yeah i think it's the size mm -hmm. yeah he, but um the dogs are very high they're very highly specially trained i mean yeah. you've heard of like mm -hmm. cadaver dogs and drug sniffing they're, dogs these dogs are yeah. that i mean that's the type of training they go, they through, go through like through. the same training yeah. they're not yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's a pretty intense. A super yeah. specialized service. Yeah. yeah. And if you're yeah, if you're anywhere in Nebraska or Iowa here on this side of the state, um they mention communities they serve, Lincoln, Omaha, Bellevue, Fremont, Norfolk, Grand Island, Hastings, Council Bluffs, Iowa, and more. Um, but also when I was looking up this particular company, other ones came up around the country. So wherever you are, right. go ahead and look up, yeah. you know, dog bed bug detection and you'll find something. Yeah. Um they, on this company also i believe they they do commercial i know that he talks about going to apartment buildings and nursing homes and a lot of that quite often but i i think that they also do single family homes um, it does say residential and commercial yeah yep. yeah so yeah. they've been very very busy there are certain times um of the year or even you know during the pandemic you know or at here after where they've been very, very, very busy. So um, they're really great. Um, I, I know actually Jody was mentioning yesterday that during the pandemic, because of more people being at home, that there might be more outbreaks. Yep, that's, people... that's what James was telling us too. So yeah. people are home. The last, home not last time we talked to him, he thought we'd be seeing uh, an uptick in it potentially as people are getting back out. Right. Because now they're going to be returning right. and doing more things out. Yeah. 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 Yep. Um, let's see. Somebody did have a question. How often do you guys deal with bed bugs? How often does this? I mean, you said it started about 10 years ago. You noticed it being a thing. How regular is this popping up? Um, it kind of ebbs and flows, like Jen mentioned. Um, we'll go weeks and weeks and weeks, sometimes months with nothing or we'll have a staff member you know with suspicions mm -hmm. who will come to us and just give us the look <laughs> we the look now so we get up and go check it out um and maybe it's something and maybe it's nothing i mean we had gone many many weeks um you know and i was in the back room with one of my um unclassified staff members and all of a sudden he went oh <laughs> and I said, what? He goes, he shut the book and he grabbed a bag and bagged it up. And he's like, I, I have a bug. I have, I have, and it was live and it was moving. And of course I went, we went to look for it and it was gone. It was, we could not find it. And I don't know what it did. They are hiders. They are hitchhikers mm -hmm. and hiders because yeah, they're sneaky. I, we almost, we almost couldn't, we couldn't find it. And we almost said, oh, okay, well, you know what? I guess maybe it wasn't what we thought it was. And didn't do anything about it and then I just moved something because he thought he had squished it in the book in between the you know the mm -hmm. cover mm -hmm. and nope and then it moved and then it it, it that wasn't a fun night but you know it, <laughs> it happens um and then it you know that caused us to have to bag up a, a huge cart because it was right after we had um stopped uh our quarantining for the pandemic Oh, of course. You know, the three day <laughs> quarantine. So yeah, so we had we had a few more materials sitting around than you know we normally would. So mm -hmm. I will say that during like the quarterly checks, um, pretty regularly they'll find at least one hmm. location. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, some mm -hmm. branches get the all clear. Um, I know that Bennett Martin in particular, being the central downtown library, I think I feel like. We, we are we are most. less likely to get an all clear um which we did last time though which was awesome because that was like the first time i think ever ever <laughs> at this location mm -hmm. um but yeah it, it really just kind of it varies like there'll be some branches that get away scot-free with the check and then others mm -hmm. you know there's like a piece of furniture that they had to spray or um a row of books that they had to treat yeah you just never know okay yeah we haven't had um, anything like all over the library 
No, we haven't had what we would call like a major infestation. Mm -hmm. And part of that is because of all the preventative, mm -hmm. you know, things that we do and the examining. Yeah. And like I said, when I treat people to do the, or excuse me, treat, train people to do the check-in, they're not just looking for bed bug stuff. You know, they're oh, looking okay. for those other damages that we see where people are writing in books or, you know, crossing out all the bad words or, you know, ripping a page uh -huh. or staining it with food or liquid. Um, so, you know, although, like Leanne said, we are the downtown central library and our collection is, is a bit older than some of our other locations. So mm. we've had things around for years. Our staff is still on top of it as far as like new damage and things like that. So the time that you spend teaching your staff how to look for this, you know, this evidence and everything, isn't going to be wasted time at time. all because you know they're also going to be looking for other kinds of damage it's yeah just and, just, and then you're deciding this well, this book is so old it is so worn exactly. it needs, needs replacing yeah. anyway so it's a whole it's part of a, more, a bigger process right yeah. right um so someone has a question i don't know the answer to this i think i do do you guys at lincoln libraries do we have an, an automated any automated material handling handling equipment or is it all just no, we don't. It's all, all, okay. uh, all touched by humans. Yeah. Because they were wondering how would that change the process for looking for damage? And I guess that'd be a, job, a question for people who have one of those kind of systems. Right. Yeah. And that's something I know when we've talked about uh, trying to get a new central library, they've talked about the um, automated check in. Um, and I, at this point, haven't been able to figure out a solid answer as to how to. Um, mm -hmm instill some of those uh, preventative measures using those. Yeah. Well, there's check-in and then there's checking after the check-in, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> there's, yeah. 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 Well, and with, with some of those automated machines, if I'm speaking to a library out there who's very familiar and has had them for years and I say something wrong, please correct me, but, um, quite often items are coming through either directly from the book dropper or, or however that works and they're getting sorted directly into different bins or areas so you automatically have that spread if you have evidence or infestation somewhere or the potential for that mm -hmm. at least that's how i understand it i'm not sure if i'm right on that um mm -hmm. but that would be a concern for me you know so i guess we'll see the, if there are different um Different processes, guess, procedures. Different, you need different to take processes, and, or even different, um, different equipment and different technology out there on the market that you know maybe, maybe have ways to treat it as it comes through the, the drop box. I don't, you know, it's got to be something. Freeze yeah. it or, or something. I don't know. All right. So we just have a last couple of comments, um, and I think we will wrap up here um, in a minute. So if you have any last minute desperate questions you want to ask of um, Leanne and Jennifer right now get them typed in but there is their contact info you can reach them at any time and Jody who did have to leave for another um, meeting um, that she said anyone who wants to you can email and reach out to her with questions you might have too um, but we have some questions comments just someone says um, we have lots of people wanting to donate boxes of books to the library as everyone does now I'll be extra careful of those boxes and yep. thanks for the photos um, I wasn't really sure what to look for so that will help a lot and as I mentioned these slides um, and Jody's already emailed me hers uh, will all be available to you guys afterwards with the recording so you can um, as long as you want to stare at the pictures and figure them out <laughs> it doesn't freak you out you'll be able to go right to it <laughs> and someone says they've had fleas they know at their library but not bed bugs that they know of now with the fixtures they'll be able to uh, let's see right differentiate yeah and I did mention too um, the Leanne and Jen mentioned that they have those letters that they um, send to their um, the patrons the first second and third they sent me copies of those so I will post them up as well too so you have the examples of the letters the notification letters um, that you could use to send all right um, yes ah Good question and something uh, we just discovered uh, yesterday. Yes, Jennifer's email is correct with three J's. In it. 
Um, <laughs> we had, uh, uh, yeah, I was trying to, they, they just changed their email addresses at Lincoln City Libraries and um, I, there must be other J. Jackson. I think we there are like several citywide addresses rather than Lincoln Library specific. Right, like the library has its own J. email addresses, and now it's going to the citywide one. And there's lots of J. Jacksons. So yes, she it is J. 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 Yeah, they had to go to our middle names, and yes, my middle name starts with a J. <laughs> so that it's is not an illusion. Not a typo. That is. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, um, I, if it makes you feel better, I did the same thing. I didn't know that my new email address was that, and I couldn't figure out what I was doing for the longest time. So, <laughs> <laughs> and and someone wants to know if your um, actual written policy is available. Is that somewhere on the Lincoln City's website, or is that that other document that you sent along? You sent along. Um, I sent the workflows documents. Um, it's, it's what we train people on. Okay. Um, the behavior policy is available online, I believe, um, but I can send that too. But that's where we have like as a level four offense, which would be having somebody leave immediately. Um, that's where they had the like repeated return of items with insects and or those observed on the body. So, um, so yes, yeah, so you can look at the Lincoln Library's website, yeah, too. All right. Um, so this is the web page that I found of the uh, canine bed bug detection here in um, Lincoln, um, residential and commercial. Call them for an estimate or appointment. And yep, communities all around um, anywhere middle of the state, east and into Iowa. And I see that he hasn't. They've had. Um, Ruby has taken uh, taken the lead, like Leanne said, Spots is semi-retired, but yeah. I, I would imagine he would say they have been so busy that they haven't even been able to update their <laughs> update the website. Update yeah, yeah, yeah so, but they yeah. do do a great job. I, I mean, when our staff sees or knows that the bed bug dogs have been here, um, there's just sort of a, you know, sense of relief. <laughs> I mean, of course, we all like to see dogs in the library, but, um, you know, it just kind of makes everybody feel feel a little better for at least for a few days. <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah. All right. Great. So um, that'll wrap it up for today's show. Um, thank you, Leanne and Jen, being there. Even though we couldn't see you on camera, I feel bad. We saw you yesterday. It's literally like still spinning. Like it's trying oh, to figure yeah, out something's gone wrong. Yay, yay technology. Yeah. Um, and thank you, Jody, Dr. Jody Green, who did have to take off. Um, um, this is great, having a lot of this great information. As I said, I've got the slides, I've got the documents, everything will be up with the recording. Um, the recording should be ready for everyone to watch by at the latest, the end of the day tomorrow, as long as GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperate with me. Um, I'll have that posted. Uh, this is our Encompass Live website. If you Google or use your search engine of choice to look up Encompass Live, it's we're the only thing called that on the internet at the moment. No one else is allowed to use that name. Um, mm -hmm. You'll come across our website with our upcoming shows. Um, but right beneath those is a link to our archives. The most recent one is at the top of the page here. This is the one from last week. Um, so the bed bug one will be here and there'll be a link just like for this one, a link to the recording. Um, but this one will have more links though. There's gonna be the two presentations and all the different documents, um, the resources, the letters and things that um, Leanne sent to me um, will be there. Everyone who attended today's show and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when the recording is ready and here for you to watch. Uh, while I'm here, I'll show you. This is our search. You have a search feature here. You can search our full archives if you want to. You can also just search the most recent 12 months if you just want some current information. Um, we have that uh, one filter there because this is the full show archives for Encompass Live. And I'm not going to scroll all the way to the bottom because it's a lot. Um, but Encompass Live premiered in January 2009. So we have over 10 years worth of recordings here, and we do have them all still here, even all the old ones. Um, so just do pay attention to the original broadcast date of any show if you do watch it. Um, some of our shows stand the test of time, you know, book reviews, different things um, may still be good, but some of them may become outdated. Um, services and programs may have changed entirely, resources may have changed, some things may no longer exist anymore, links may be broken, websites we've shared, don't work anymore. Um, so just pay attention when you are watching one of these. Um, 
how old it might be. Um, but we will always keep everything up here. You know, we are librarians, we archive things and keep things for historical purposes. So um, as long as we have a place to um, uh, store them, we will keep them there. Um, we do also have a Facebook page for Encompass Live that I link to here. I've got it open over here. If you do are a big Facebook user, give us a like. You'll get reminders. Here's a reminder to log in today's show. Yes, uh, we are aware that is not a bad bug on that picture. Um, as Jody mentioned in our in a tweet she sent out, we didn't want to scare people away. <laughs> um, but that was just the picture we picked. That was for a little graphic there. But we do reminders of the shows that are coming up, letting people know when the recordings are available, anything else of interest. So if you do like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. We do have a um, hashtag we use elsewhere, um, Instagram, Twitter, and Comp Live, a little abbreviation there for the show. So you can also look for that out uh, on other social media to see what we're doing um, or just you know, keep an eye on our website. So um, that'll wrap it up for today's show. I um, hope you join us next week. Um, it's uh, the last Wednesday of the month, so it is Pretty Sweet Tech Day. Um, once a month, Amanda Sweet, our technology innovation librarian, comes on the show to talk about anything tech-related. Um, she comes out other times too, but she always is here the last Wednesday of the month. And next week, we're going to be doing something that I think might be fun, talking about spatial, a 3D meeting space that you can use. Um, everyone's doing a lot more virtual remote things. We've been doing Encompass Live, as I said, for over 10 years, but people are doing a lot more ways of meeting together. Um, so Chad Marin from the Innovation Librarian down in um, St. Petersburg College, Florida is going to be with Amanda to talk about that. And he has some instructions here for you to set up an account ahead of time if you want to actually participate within Spatial and um, meet up with him using your own avatar. So we've got some instructions there um, to you know, do some pre-setup for next week's show. Um, is that required? We're going to be broadcasting here at the GoToWebinar, but it might be something fun you might want to do to be more um, interactive with it. So a little special session. So go ahead and register for that and any of our other shows we have coming up on Encompass Live. Thank you everybody for being here with us this morning and hopefully we'll see you on a future episode. Thank you. Krista. Thank you, Krista. Yeah, thank you guys. Bye bye. <laughs>